All right, everyone. So last time we left off on diffusion, where we were referring to diffusion is always going from high to low, that it's the, ways the, uni the way the universe spreads molecules in any given space. And again, we left off here. We have a cube, which is high in our solute. If we place it into a space without anything or low, then we know that if we place it, the high content where that cube is will eventually, with some time, go and travel to the location where it is lowest, which is above up here, with enough time. And after enough time, all of it will eventually be equally dispersed, and we consider that to be in equilibrium or not really have any net movement, any net movement. And then we talked about what happens if there's a barrier involved. We talked about if there, that this experiment or this little model replicates what happens in a cell membrane. That if we have that same beaker and you have these particular solutes, that they're always bouncing along with each other at random. They're crashing all over the place with each other and even along the membrane. But occasionally one of them is going to bump in through these open pores that allow it to go through at the right angle, and if you give it enough time, what we see is that there will be no net diffusion of molecules. And so what that means now is that we saw, over here we started with one, two, three, four, five, five molecules on that side, and then only one on this side. And if you give it enough time, what we can expect is that the molecules eventually will be evenly distributed. Now, this is the one complicated thing is that molecules are not always just sitting in place. They are always still crashing and colliding with each other, even on this side and on this side. They just happen to collide with each other more when there's more molecules. And doesn't it make sense? If there's 20 people in a small pool, there's the chance of them crashing if they're just swimming around is higher. But if you have less people in the pool, right, four people in that whole pool, then you can expect maybe you're not barely ever going to crash into them. And so if you look at this, though, they are still crashing with each other. It's just not happen happening as frequently as it was before. And so we consider molecules as having no net movement, not because one, they stop going across, but in fact, one will still go through, and as the other one goes through, one will go in. So that's why we still say that there is no net movement, and that's really because there's no net change in anything, meaning that no matter what, you will still always have four on each side. When one goes to that side, the other one goes towards the other side. And so that's sort of the difference with, when we look at that, is that there's still movement across, but they're not actually changing the numbers on each side. So there, that's what equilibrium is. It means to still have movement, but it's not changing really what the other, one, other side is. And when we left off, we left off on facilitated diffusion. That is, it is the same concept as we saw over here in our little example in that there's always going to be some, and I'm going to go ahead and reset this little illustration now. And when we look at this illustration, when we think about facilitated diffusion now, what would be the difference in this situation versus facilitated diffusion? And really all it really comes down to is that this plasma membrane Fits, fits or it allows for these pores or these uh, objects or these solutes to go across much more easier because now the pores are much larger. So it's facilitating diffusion because now they don't actually have to hit it at the perfect angle. They can just actually go in really easily because the pore size has increased. And so drawing it to how it's relevant into uh, cell biology is that that barrier in our beaker in our previous example is our plasma membrane. Things that are lipid soluble can go through the lipid membrane because it's made of lipids. And so lipid-like molecules can travel through it because it's like just like it, so it can diffuse through. 
But facilitated diffusion requires there to be some sort of protein increasing the pore size. And so now larger molecules that have more trouble diffusing through the plasma membrane, they can actually, they may be able to go through this plasma membrane, but it's easier, it's facilitated better if they go through their channel proteins. And so that process of incorporating integrated proteins into the plasma membrane is an act of facilitated diffusion and also referred to as passive transport. This is a key highlight here. And if you hopefully remember, passive transport has to do with dealing with not having any energy, right? You're not using any energy. It's just creating a channel protein, a channel protein in the plasma. And then when we look at this second segment here, the active transport segment, this active transport, let the A remind you that it's going to require ATP. It's going to require energy. And if we're doing a versus, right, like ver act passive transport versus active transport, active requires energy. And because it requires energy, it can do something that the universe can't do, is that it can go from low to high without, with the use of energy. Again, the universe naturally, without any energy, will move one molecule from high to low. That's like a nature written in as, as true as gravity is. But again, the cell or any living creature uses, expends its energy to be able to, it's for its cells to be able to go from low to high. And so that's all independent concentration, independent of concentration gradient meant. And a recap, if you don't remember what concentration gradient was, is that it always just meant high to low. When we saw in our first note, concentration gradient, it referred to things being in, uh, things moving from high to low. That's where we sort of left off in total. So active transport goes from low to high. And that's all independent yeah, independent of concentration gradient means. Now, a useful ion pump is that this is an example of active transport. Before we actually break down the nitty gritty of like what's going on with the arrows, what we have to do as students is that we have to register the most common ions. These you need to know and you need to register moving forward. You have sodium. That's what Na plus stands for. I would write that out, sodium. I guess I'll write it out here myself now that it works nicely and let's uh, show doesn't see the interface no this one okay it's not changing okay so anyways ion pump so this first one's gonna be sodium Sodium, that's a U. It's trying to be a U. Let's zoom in. The K stands for potassium. The Ca2 plus is calcium. And Mg is magnesium. And this is their elemental name, not their ion name, but it's okay today. And these are just ones that we're going to be running into occasionally throughout the semester. And so it's important to know what these symbols mean. These are essentially the ions, like cations. If it's positive, remember from our set of notes about charges, that if it's positive, they are cations. If they're negative, they're anions. So these are all positive cations. They're the ion forms of the atom. And so with that, 
we can see now that this sodium potassium ATPase is telling you exactly what's going to be involved. It's going to use sodium, it's going to use potassium, which is going to be Na+, and this K+, respectively, right? This one going with potassium, this one with sodium. And then we see ATPase. That's the name of the protein that's embedded in the plasma membrane because it utilizes our energy molecule produced by the mitochondria called the ATP. And so this is a special type of enzyme that can actually exchange sodium for potassium. And so if we look at our image here, you can see sodium is being moved from the inside to the outside. And so exchanges three intracellular, meaning in the cell, and they're moving towards the outside region where we have our extracellular fluid. They're traveling to the outside, so it changes three sodiums, and it brings in two potassiums with the use of ATP. That's all this means. Three go out, extracellular, two potassiums go in, and it had to use ATP. This one will come back when we go into nervous and a little bit into next week when we really get into a little more detail with regarding facilitated and active transport. And then so since we are going to retouch on this next week, when we go over what exactly cells secrete and things like that, so what I want you to do is pretend this doesn't exist here, and I'm just going to move this to the next packet I'm going to give you all next week. So you can go ahead and cross this off. I want you all to keep it simple today. Know the difference between facilitated diffusion and active transport, and we've done everything we need to enter into next week. Keeping it light, and then we get a little more complicated. Okay, now, as we examine this page, we have gone through our cell biology, we've seen what all, we have a function for all of our organelles, and we know that they're capable of secreting things into that, they're outside of themselves, right? Some of them can secrete mucus, some of them can secrete um, vesicles and waste, things like that. They can remove it from their cells. Now, tissues was always about when one cell meets another one. And so we have four family of tissues that are the subject of the lab and also of lecture. So the good news is that this week we, have re we are really going to be doing a lot of repetition. It's going to feel like a review of what lab is, but we have to refine a lot of our concepts. So epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue. Remember that this is a typo from the publisher. This should say muscle tissue. And then finally, we have our nervous tissue. Four different tissues we're going to keep us focused. And today, we're going to go over epithelial tissues in lecture. So moving into epithelial tissues. And so if we look at the umbrella of terms, you can see that we have, if we look, just look at epithelial tissues, you can see that we go into two families. We go into epithelial, and then we go into glands. Try to remember that in lab, we learned that each one of these is going to be an individual cell with its own organelles. We're seeing the nucleus here in the center, and then it would have all the organelles in the cytoplasm. The fluid inside is the cytosol, and the plasma membrane is the boundary around it. The boundary around it. And we had a formula we learned in lab. We have epithelial tissue up here, and then what's that line that keeps it glued onto at the bottom? the basement membrane. And what's the tissue, family of tissues underneath? Mm -hmm. Connective tissue. So if we compare that to the other family of epithelial tissue, we break into two categories. Epithelia, everything you've learned in lab. Glands, we learned a very, very loose version of this. But what it means is, it's nothing you can't understand now, is that I'm going to get rid of this text, this little extra text. But now here, if you look at the surface, this is your apical end, right, the polar end. This is the base. And one more time, what's this line there? Basement membrane. This is our basement membrane.
basement membrane. And so the only way you've seen tissues right now is you've seen them like this. But you have to translate this image to this part up here at the very top. This portion that you're seeing here, this is an epithelial layer, just this portion. And we know we have our basement membrane, and we know that underneath all epithelial tissue always lies the next connective family of tissues, connective tissue. That's all the CT means, is that everything here is connective tissue. So you're drawing your eyes to this region up top. This is all epithelial tissue. It looks like simple cuboidal to us, right? And what it does on the surfaces or linings is that it goes and embeds itself into connective tissue and it serves as glands. And so we're going to see a lot of tissues will start off as one thing like stratified squamous, stratified squamous. And then when you go inside a sweat pore on your skin, then though it, you just have a little opening and your epithelial cells turn into glands. And then these will change, and it won't be stratified squamous anymore. It'll become, what's one of the popular ones that are loved to absorb and secrete? Anybody remember? Cuboidal cells. So cuboidal cells are absorbing and secreting. They're secreting, and remember, what's their location for cuboidal cells? Glands. So we're seeing now glands. And so epithelial has this weird thing that it serves as a lining or a boundary, and then it just happens to create a pore, and then that pore will create a brand new epithelial cell, some of the ones that you already know, and then they're going to secrete substances into this space, and then they'll make their way to the outside space here. And that's all we're going to see. And we're going to get into a little more detail when we get to that. But epithelial tissues can break apart into two branches, glands and epithelia epithelia and glands. We learned in lab that they are avascular. They don't have direct blood vessels linking into these spaces. They do not have nutrient supply being secreted into that space. The connective tissues below are responsible for providing nutrients there. So epithelial is described as avascular. They cover exposed areas, and they cover the inner lining of things. Exposed outer areas like our skin and the inner lining of things. And again, they can possess glands in within the epithelium. That's what we're seeing here is that the epithelial cells will just be a boundary. Normally, we've always seen it like this, just a boundary, a boundary, a boundary. And then all of a sudden, they just happen to go inside into the connective and form a unique gland. And then they're just continuous like that. And so this statement hopefully makes sense to all of us now that glands are derived from epithelia. So they were surface and then they became our gland. One last time. And you have two types of gland. You have an exocrine gland and an endocrine gland. And the difference lies is that if you were to compare both of them, exocrine glands, secrete out of duct. I'll explain what that means in a second. Endocrine. And I'm going to write in parentheses to remind you of the major endocrine, right? We've all heard of this word by now, that it involves hormones, it involves glands. And so hormones, they're required to be placed in the interstitial fluid. You know it as, right now, you know another word for this as extra cellular fluid. And I'm going to put a little flow diagram, blood vessels. Oops. Sorry, I'm moving into a better space right now. There we go. Secrete out of duct, 
and the hormones place it into the fluid and then they have to eventually go to the blood vessels. That's the fundamental difference between the two. And you can understand what this means. Secret out of duct. Secrete out of duct, not secret, sorry. And when we look at this space now, I'm going to highlight it in orange. This is a duct. Do we see this? Like this is what the, the duct actually is. It's an, an entryway or a break in the epithelial boundary that we see here. A duct sort of goes into the body, goes deep into the body or into the connective tissue towards the basement membrane. I'm trying to say it in many ways so it can register, but that's the best I'm going to be able to do now. That's the duct. And so that's it. It's as simple as when a gland secretes, and it's an exocrine gland, it secretes its substances right here onto the surface. That's it. It just goes right through the duct. It's that simple from point A to point B. Nothing complicated about it. Endocrine, however, it relies on to secrete it to the surface, and then it has to go eventually to part two to a blood vessel, and then that blood vessel will deliver that hormone throughout the body. But it requires, again, the use of being of blood vessels. Exocrine, exo means right outside. So it's just like, oh, they just secrete it right outside onto their surface. Think about it in that manner. And so secrete onto external surfaces or the ducts. The endocrine, it requires, this it secretes hormones into the fluid, the outside space of the cell, and hormones can then be placed into the bloodstream. It's the most common form of endocrine glands. That's why the endocrine system is its own study, but they're made of epithelial tissues. And so with that, there's one last thing I did want to add. The word interstitial, tish, uh, interstitial fluid. Now, we've learned so far, and you don't have to scroll back, but you've seen it before that we saw previously that we had our plasma membrane. We had the inside of the cell, which was the cytoplasm. We had the outside of the cell called the extracellular fluid, and that's what interstitial fluid is, is that if you just think about extracellular fluid, it's sort of like thinking about just one cell, just one cell. But remember that in this context, this is just one cell. And so the extracellular fluid of this one is going to be outside here. It may even be outside here because, it's, again, it's just a fluid outside of this cell. Extracellular fluid. Now, what does the word interstitial fluid mean? It's just the implication that all of this one's going to have a fluid, then if it's a fluid. It's not different from this fluid. It's not different from this fluid. It's not different from this fluid. So this entire fluid space that they are all sharing is called interstitial fluid. That's all. If we translate it to this image, this is technically the interstitial fluid space of all of our epithelial cells that we see up here. So interstitial fluid just means the fluid that they're all in contact with. And that's really it for that. And so, some common things that are going to sound familiar is that we had our apical. We had our apical surface and our base of when we look at our epithelial tissue that if we look at epithelial cells, we are seeing now, they're sort of broken up apart for us. We are seeing, what shape cell is this? Columnar cell. So this is a columnar cell type here. And then if you see next to it, right next to it, there is another cell. I love this image because it shows the relationship. It shows their individuality in the sense that when you look at the inside of this cell, you can see what's the two of your organelles. What's this large one? Nucleus, which has stained on all our tissues. It's always been that darker dot. What's inside of the nucleus? Our DNA, right? And DNA, what usually, what's the message that, the message that comes out from DNA? Messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA is going to go to what organelle? No worries, let's ask that again. RNA will be turned into what organic compound? Proteins. And what does, what turns RNA into proteins? Ribosomes. And so, 
if you have ribosomes on this sheet, how do we know what what do we what's the name of this object here? The rough ER, because each one of them has a ribosome. If they have ribosomes, then what is the rough ER responsible for making? Proteins. Nice and simple. Proteins. And what is the one without ribosomes called? Smooth ER. And they make lipids. And where do we need lipids? on our cell, on the plasma membrane. All of this region needs lipids. Those phospholipids, those glycolipids, all make up that boundary, all made by smooth ER. The rough ER makes those proteins. You've been learning of some that go into the actual membrane, like the sodium potassium pump. This is a protein. It was made by a ribosome. It was made by a ribosome on the rough ER. It was delivered to the plasma membrane by this structure here. What's this structure? Golgi. And these little vesicles are called uh, endosomes, right? And so these vesicles go and they travel and deliver those proteins and they place those little ATPase proteins that exchange sodium and potassium up here on the surface. Okay? And so, if we look at the relationship between them now, and that's what we're focusing on, we don't care about the individual organelles. We care about how they actually sit together, how they interact together. And so that's what the subject is now. And when you see that the epithelial tissues arrange themselves in a linear order, and you have to think of them as sort of if human beings grabbed arms and they interlocked with each other, we form this tight barrier together and so that's what cells are doing is that they have proteins specialized in actual cell to cell communication they have proteins involved in keeping them anchored to the basement membrane they have proteins involved in anchoring them here on this apical end on the side closest to the lumen the surface portion and so that's what our subject is for today so first we have to know the polarity of the cells. The word polarity in and of itself isn't, should not be confusing to you. It just means it has two different ends. If you look at the cell, this apical surface is going to be the portion on top, right? In contact with the lumen. In contact with the lumen. The base is going to be on the side where we have our basement membrane. That's going to be this entire bottom portion that we've learned about now. Basement membrane. We've learned about the base only, really. Base, and I taught it to you in lab as basal. Like this, basal. But base or basal, they're interchangeable. And that's going to be this region down here. That's base or basal. Now, basolateral is a combination of the word base and lateral, so it means base, but it also means the side. So you can see that that's another way of seeing your angles or your anatomical language being used. Here's base for meaning that there's an arrow even leading to it, leading to the base. Lateral means that it's also referring to the side as well. So it's a combination of this one and this one. That's what this word means. Basal lateral. Let the arrow show you. But just the bottom end is base or basal. And let's write that in there. Basal. And that's the polarity. We have a top side and a bottom side to speak simply. You're never going to encounter microvilli or cilia on the basal end or the basal lateral surface. Why would you encounter it? So let the apical surface remind you that the lumen is up here, the open space, the inside of a tube, the lumen. So the lumen and the apical surface are always next to each other. That's the open space above, the open space above. You can see, and this is a nice little image to show two different types of structures you've already explored. Our columnar cells come in two shapes, or two apical shapes, in that they have cilia, which want to do, what's the function of that function? It's already written there for you, but moves mucus. That's the role of cilia. And the role of microvilli, what is it? To absorb. To absorb. 
And so our columnar cells on their apical ends will have microvilli or cilia in contact with the lumen. They're either going to be moving mucus in the lumen or they're going to be absorbing in the lumen, from the lumen, right? That's microvilli's job is to absorb in this direction and the cilia are responsible for moving the mucus in one direction. That's what they do is that they move mucus. And so again, polarity just means to have differences on both ends. All right, so moving forward, and I guess uh, just to give, that's the first little fundamental aspect. It's easier to talk about it after. The study of histology is studying tissues. And when cells work together, we refer to that as tissues. The subject for today of this packet ends on neural. So it's epithelial, muscle, and neural. So you're going to see a lot of intense overlap. So hopefully today you're feeling a little more relief as, as, uh, in regards to how much content you have to absorb. So some functions, we have to know the functions of epithelial tissue. They provide a physical pro uh, protection. A great example is our skin, which is going to be next week's topic. So protection against friction, abrasion. They help make us waterproof, like our skin doesn't allow water to exit the inside of my body to the outside. And they also are great at destroying bio, um, biological agents. But this fact, I don't test you on this because it's a little difficult to visualize in our beginning end. So what's fa my favorite one is abrasion and protection from loss of water. So focus on these here. Those are the most important ones to me. They control permeability. That means that they decide what goes in. And you could even think to it in this case here. When you think about this cell, not everything's going to be absorbed in the microvilli. Not everything's going to go into the cell. Some stuff is going to go on the lumen. The microvilli are like, nope, I don't want it. Keep going. And they just keep going down the lumen. And then eventually they'll be removed from the body in a different way. So to be permeable, to be selectively permeable, means that they can decide what goes in because they have also specialized ATPase, right? They have those little proteins that take in sodium, they take out potassium at their own rate against the diffusion high to low, right? Those active transport proteins are deciding only sodium and potassium go in. We haven't even talked about calcium. Sometimes calcium can be on the surface and they're like, nope, I don't care, keep going, I don't care. So that's sort of an example of how those active facilitated proteins, those active proteins from active transport, that's how they're capable of bringing things in. They're deciding what goes in. They're being selective as to what goes into the cell. And they can also secrete things. We've seen how glands or these cells are capable of actual secretion of materials from vesicles through exocytosis they're capable of releasing materials onto the outside lumen if they wanted to. So they have the ability to absorb and secrete. We're going to see that when we get to skin, that epithelial cells, they may not have blood vessels. They may be avascular, but one thing that they will have that's unique is that you'll see that some of them can actually have linkages. And I'm trying to draw this without over um, conflating this up image and I, I don't want you to focus on it right now because we're going to see a real example of it in a second so I'm not going to draw anything into this image because I want this image to stay focused on the topics here so all I'm going to say when we get to skin you're going to see that our stratified squamous tissue which will be in a second our stratified squamous epithelial has nerve endings in it if it has nerve nervous tissue in it it's called neuroepithelia neural epithelia and we'll see an example of that next week and I'll bring it right back so don't worry produce special actually let's write it in here and I'm gonna write C right here C integument packet and that's next week's packet just as a reminder And you already should know this next topic, produces specialized secretions, what secretes when they actually make glands, right? Since they're capable of making glands, that's kind of self-explanatory, glands secrete substances. 
And then last little feature stat here, the apical surface will always be in contact with the lumen. I'm just summarizing what I've already mentioned. Microvilli, the function of microvilli is to absorb nutrients. The function of cilia is going to be to move mucus. And so let's write these facts in. Absorb. And cilia moves mucus to make our notes complete. And I'm going to write mucin. You might see this word, mucin. They both mean the same thing to us. And do not forget, they are all individual cells, each one possessing their own organelles. And for the most part, that's it. We're just going to leave it simple. They have their own organelles, just like every other cell. All right, let's move on. I got a question. Ask away. Mm-hmm. Blood vessels are considered a connective tissue. And so if we see this connective tissue, this is sort of summarizing that we're going to find a bit of the connective tissues here. You're going to find one that's called adipose or fat tissue. Today's Tuesday's lab should be more versed on this. But you're going to find fat here. You're going to find blood vessels here because blood vessels is considered to contain blood, which is a connective tissue. So the blood vessels will release the nutrients into the connected tissue space, into the interstitial fluid in this space, and then those nutrients will make their way into the epithelia. They will make their way into the epithelia, but the blood vessels are within the connective tissue layer here. All right. Yes. Yeah. So if we were discussing an endocrine gland, you, I would need you all to imagine this, is that if we're looking at an endocrine, this doesn't exist. And I'm going to go ahead and block it out in black here to get to his point, because it's a very good point. We're going to pretend this doesn't exist. And so what an endocrine gland would do is that it doesn't, exocrine secretes it into the duct, but a duct doesn't exist in this case. What it does is that it'll secrete it here. And what did we learn? What's vascularity? Blood vessels. And which part of this image has blood vessels? The connective tissue portion. So it'll secrete the hormones into, let me write it out. Hormones will be secreted into the fluid on this outside space. And then a blood vessel, a blood vessel will be nearby. And then we will see our little hormones make their way into the blood vessel. And the blood vessel will transport those hormones everywhere through the body. Everywhere. And then the last simple way of understanding this too Exocrine gland is, this is the literal act of exocrine gland, is if I have a secretion, and this could be mucus, right, or sweat, this is an exocrine secretion right here. It's right there on the surface. That's it. I delivered it right here. The gland is right there. The surface is right there. It places that surface, that, that material right there on the surface. Endocrine is like doing this. It's like grabbing this, and I grab an envelope. I'm going to pretend this is an envelope, one for mailing. Too big, I'm gonna drop everything. This one seems pretty empty. I'm gonna put it, I place it inside of this envelope, and then I put it in the mailbox, and then that gets delivered somewhere out throughout the body. That's the big difference. This is exocrine. Exocrine is delivering it right through the passageway, like that, right next to it, this far away. But endocrine is to place it into like a mail slot, and this will be delivered to the other building. So endocrine relies on the release of hormones to be released out into the interstitial fluid to find the blood vessels that are here, enter the plasma or the fluid of the blood, and then it'll transport the nutrients somewhere else. But exocrine only just secretes it, secretes it, lets it out onto the surface. That's the major difference between the two. I have another question. Ask away. So uh, the exocrine, it doesn't deliver nutrients, it delivers like milk and stuff, because it doesn't clarify this. 
That clarification doesn't matter today. And endocrine is always going to be involved with hormones. Sorry, hormones, period, hormones. And, and I don't want to say anything because, you know, there's this hormone called prolactin that's released from the brain. Oh, this is the perfect example. Actually, thank you for saying that. If you think about there's this little gland in our brain, not really for males, but females when they are um, breastfeeding, the, during that process, there's this hormone called prolactin released from the brain that finds its way into the blood vessels and travels to the blood vessels, goes to the mammary glands or to the breast, and then it encourages it to produce milk. That's an example of endocrine communicated all the way from the brain down here. Now, there's an exocrine function here. What's the exocrine function? What is it? The release of the milk. And it's right here. Did the milk have to travel down here? and then be released down here. Was the breastfeeding here? No, it was right here. So when they're breastfeeding, the milk goes directly out onto the duct to the surface right where it's at. The milk didn't need to travel down here, come all the way back up through my bloodstream, and then come out of the nipple. It just came out from right there, the gland, secreted it right there onto the surface. That's an example of exocrine versus endocrine involving the same gland, right? The brain communicated it, a hormone from all the way up here send it into the blood vessels, it arrived here, and then exocrine is to release the milk just from that location where it, the milk is. Repeat that last little segment, that last segment. Like when they start leaking out when they don't breastfeed on time, is that also kind of like part of the You mean when they're, f like, uh, when, um, um, when you're, too full to speak easily, right? That's a, you know, it's a, it works like in the sense that it, the body cares to have more milk than to run out. And so if it's leaking, it's probably just because there's excessive milk. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's like a... All I can say is that endocrine, sometimes there is a loop that tells the body, oh, there is too much milk in here. Let's stop making it. But I will say that there's a limit to it. And it's not perfect. It's not perfect. It doesn't, it doesn't match the appetite of the child sometimes. Yes. And, and to, so the rate of production can vary between every female. And the diet or the appetite of the child can vary. So I'm just going to say it just really isn't that there's just, uh, there's just, it's being told to produce milk. Whether there is too much, it's a separate story. But thank you, that's an awesome question to um, talk about those two things. And so with that, let's move on to the attachment. So this is about inter intercellular connection. Let's break this word down. Between cells. Between cells. That's what intercellular means, between cells. So we're seeing how cells connect with each other. And so, now these slides, I think I uh, messed it up when I was putting them in a particular order, so I will require you to actually go to the next slide and we're going to have to come back, but the good news is that they, there is an order to the numbering. So I would like to start there with the orders, that's the only reason why. So number one is going to be our hemidesmosomes. And our hemidesmosomes are going to be a protein network that keep it bound to the base. And that boundary was the basement membrane. And you have now learned how our cells stay anchored to the basement membrane. Is that they rely on these tiny connections called hemidesmosomes that link to our plasma membrane. Now, our basement membrane is comprised of two parts. Two parts. And they are written for you here. Here's part one. And here's part two. It has, if we zoom in down here to this image below, this is a zoomed up image of our hemidesmosomes. A zoomed up image of our hemidesmosomes. And what we encounter is that our basement membrane has two layers to it. It has what we refer to as a basal lamina. And doesn't this word sound familiar? Basal. Lamina is like a, a word to mean sheet. 
in Latin. So basal sheet is going to be the one that's right on the basal side of the cell. If we apply it to a larger picture, this upper end of that basement membrane, which is going to be, again, this segment in blue down here, it has broken part into two segments. The part that's in contact with the base of the cell is called the basal lamina. Maybe now you know why I let you call it basal end. Basal lamina. And it's made out of a few things that you learned about already. It's made out of proteins with a sugar molecule attached to it, glycoproteins. And it's made, or it's always going to be on the basal surface of cells, okay? Meaning in contact with the bottom of the cell. The reticular lamina is going to be the second portion of that connection. This is going to be in contact with the connective tissue below, and it is called reticular lamina, as shown on your diagram. It's already labeled there on your diagram below. And this is where you're going to encounter protein fibers, fibers, which are going to be very, we're going to be, see this a lot in connective tissue. We'll get to it. And otherwise, that's what keeps it bound. And it also limits uh, diffusion. It's what's regulating diffusion. All right. And if we move to a next one, this next one's going to sound very similar. It's going to be desmosomes. Hemidesmosomes anchor things to the base. But the cells themselves have a lateral aspect. They have a lateral aspect, the one next to each other. And so they have an attachment that keeps them firmly attached to each other. It's not shown on this side, but I kind of just kind of circled it. But here is an example of it. So if we go to that segment on our list for desmosomes, we're going to have to go here. And I just like to, again, keep that order because hemidesmosomes, it's easy to understand what it does. It anchors at the base. What do desmosomes do? They interlock between adjacent cells, meaning the cells that are lateral to it. They do the exact same thing. Only difference is that hemidesmosomes anchor to the base. Desmosomes anchor at a lateral aspect. The protein involved is also different, or the layers involved. Desmosomes had a basal lamina. It had a reticular lamina. But the desmosomes, all they have is something called cell adhesion molecules, or for short, CAMs. And what is the word? What's an adhesive? Anybody know what that word means? A glue. So this is literally mole protein molecules that serve as glue. That's all an adhesion molecule is, something that keeps it glued together. And what keeps it glued is another combination of proteins and carbohydrates. And this you can cross off. But this is actually what gives it its uh, very uh, sticky texture. But this is a little too much. And it doesn't allow them to move across. One of my favorite ways to think about desmosomes is that when we look at tile, the, you can see the cracks, but if you throw liquid, you'll see that it won't necessarily let the liquid just go right through it, and it'll just sort of leave the liquid through the crack on top. And so that's sort of what you're sort of um, seeing is being used, uh, what the desmosomes do for the cell, is that it provides a very tight attachment. And so it makes sense that we're going to find it on the superficial layers of the skin in the stratified squamous. That's what makes stratified squamous epithelia so useful because all the cells are so bound together so tightly because of desmosomes. And let's see. Now our next one, number two. And I know I went just out of order for that one, but I'll change it and update the slides. Now, when we look at tight junctions, these tight junctions are going to be ex doing exactly what they're going to be. They're going to form a form a side of attachment on the base. Sorry, the apical end of our cells. On the apical end of our cells, they prevent solutes from going through 
this initial area, right? Because water is going to be on this end of the loom. When you drink water, it's going through your GI tract. You sometimes don't need to be absorbing water. You don't need to be, your mucus doesn't need to be going between the cracks of your cell. And so what tight junctions do is that they're preventing any passageway of all those fluids and all those solutes from going in between the lateral sides of the plasma membranes. And just want to reiterate something here. Now, when you're looking at this diagram, that this outer boundary is the plasma membrane of this cell. This is the plasma membrane of this cell, the cell next to it. And so when we look at tight junctions, they're preventing the flow of things between the plasma membrane space. So tight junctions are sort of blocking anything from entering that space between the plasma membranes. And that's what this note means is that they, they do so by interlocking the plasma membrane. Let's zoom in. This is a picked up. We blow up this image. You're seeing this. And this is the plasma membrane. I'm going to write it in, actually. This is the plasma membrane of one cell. Dang it. Plasma membrane. And this is the plasma membrane of a separate cell. And what it's kind of doing is stitching them together. Tight junctions. And it's preventing things from entering into this precious space between the plasma membranes. They don't need things just falling through between the cells. And so our interlocking membrane proteins are the ones that are keeping them anchored together. That little highlight that we're seeing here. And that's all this definition means. Tie, tightens or ties or buttons up the plasma membranes together. This little point, I feel like I say it, I read it when, you know, when you take things out, they sound like they make sense. But this could be complicated. But again, this is the simple explanation for this is it prevents things from falling in between the space between the plasma membrane. That's all that third point is. So if you want to make a point to yourself for this bracketed point there, is that it just prevents things from going between the plasma membranes. And this fact, I hate that it's here. I'm going to make you cross it out, this. A lot of tissues have it. It's not just there. I don't know why they, um, I didn't notice that the first time. All right. And then the last thing I'm going to add, take off here, is I want you to remove the adhesion belt. I want you to remove it. You do not need to know this. And it's only because I'm feeling a little generous. And even if you see the definition, it sort of does the same thing. It reinforces tight junctions. They just happen to be made of something different. But you know what? We're learning, and this is already complicated enough. So I'm going to take this one off. And you don't have to worry about adhesion belts on any one of your slides. So you can get rid of adhesion belts. We don't, do not care. We do not care. And now there is one last one. Gap junction. Gap junctions is our last one, and the associated term is connexons. Connexons, what they're responsible for is that they are pores between cells. If we put it together on our big picture, well, we look at it first here, you can see it, this would be cell number one, this would be a separate cell, and they're able to share materials through the connexons, which make up the gap junctions. And if we look at it in our little diagram, you can see that's the pores that, that go through there. They are sort of these little canals between the cells, between the cells. So that's the big difference between gap junctions and say tight, sorry, the, no, no, sorry. The, the gap junctions and the tight junctions, yes, is that the tight junctions are knitted together just to prevent things from flowing in the middle of the spaces. And then the gap junctions, want communication between each other. Big difference there. That's what gap junctions do. And so assist in chemical communication. 
This little ba bit here is a little bit of extracellular bile that you don't need, or beating of cilia. You do not need that fact. And this could uh, be a little more confusing than I really would like you to be, so do not worry about this. When we get to respiratory, maybe I'll bring it back. And so with that, I guess that's really it. This is another fact that I'm going to need you to remove as well. I'm just trying to make this as easily comprehensible without adding too much. So I'll remove it for next semester. And then to make a full summary of all of this, remember that these are all going to be things that are found in epithelial tissues, not in connective, not in nervous, And we're only talking about epithelial attachments. You technically kind of do find them, but it's different. So right now, just keeping it simple, I'm only going to ask you about this in epithelial tissue. Okay, I hope everybody's got that. And then don't forget our fact that epithelia lacks blood vessels. And here's that last little fact. It requires an attachment to an underlying connective tissue. This is just a, a sentence to describe that you need blood vessels in the underlying connective tissue in order for these cells to get the materials they need to make more of themselves, to create secretions, to repair. They have to be attached to a connective tissue and a basement membrane below it on the basal side. On the basal side. All right, I think I got everything. I think I removed everything you will not need. And let's move on. And now the last bit of the class is everything you already know. It's going to be a nice little refresher for your lab exam leading till next week. For we're going to learn, we're going to read, touch on the epithelial tissues, and we're going to add a little bit of extra little tiny facts that you need for lecture. But I'm going to try to stay focused on what we know in lab. So that way we can use the same facts for both the lecture and the lab exam. So... Recall in lab that you should be pros at this now, that you have a layout or an arrangement of cells, right? So I'm going to write layout. I'm going to change this to green. And arrangement, layout or arrangement. They work the same for me. And as we examine this, as we examine this, sorry, I lost my little pen. And so as we examine this, remember that you have two concepts to everything. It comes with one, the layout first. Then it comes out second with the shape. And so to see if any of you remember, I, can any of you draw simple squamous underneath your paper somewhere? Draw simple squamous for me, just like six or seven cells. And then draw stratified squamous. What would they look like? Right? Hopefully we drew something similar like that. S flattened ce cells and stratified squamous would be cells that become flat. They might be a little rounded, but they're flat for the most part. And they're stacked on top of each other. Right, the cell type is going to be squamous cell, squamous cell, but the way that they're arranged is how many layers you have. So this one has at least two layers, two layers. So stratified means to be layered. And so the theme is continuous, that all you have to do is if you have a simple cuboidal, you're changing your shape. If you have a simple, if you have a simple, squamous you have that shape if you have simple cuboidal you're substituting for that shape simple columnar you're substituting for that shape exactly like we did in lab okay so this isn't shouldn't be anything new and now fun facts we have ventral body cavities one that wraps around the heart and it has a parietal wall and a visceral wall does anybody know what that cavity that surrounds the heart is called do we remember? Pericardial cavity. What was the cavity that wraps around the lungs? Pleural cavity. And what is it made out of? 
you now know it is made out of simple squamous and that's what mesothelia is it is the pericardial cavity the pleural cavity i'm gonna write that little note here peri cardio cavity it is the pleural cavity plural pardon plural dang i forget that i can zoom in and write better on this let's see oh dang it wrong thing wrong thing and let's redo this sit a little more comfortable there we go and now and peritoneal the pericardial wraps around what the pleura and the peritoneal we're missing a word here such so with a v viscera very nice the digestive organs every single organ you have is protected by a membrane that has a little lubricated fluid inside they called serous fluid i'll show you pictures of it next week when we come back but if it's a lecture thing but otherwise that simple squamous is called mesothelium mesothelium the inside of blood vessels, and I'm going to draw this here for you. Hopefully you're all good drawers. I'm just kidding. I'm not a good drawer. So here, here, that's a blood vessel. And inside, you would encounter simple squamous lining the inside of it. And I'll stop there. I wish I hadn't gone all the way, but yes, this way, this way. And again, the inside of that entire tube, the inner lining of a blood vessel will have simple squamous. And that has the name endothelia. Thelium is plural, but all of these are endothelium, the inner lining. You just have inside of your blood vessels a simple line of squamous cells. And what was squamous cells, what was their specialty? What was like their, their superpower? What they do they provide for the body? What are they great at? Because they're so thin. Diffusion. Diffusion, good. And so if we look at our notes, functions, one of them that we saw in diffusion. So gases can go through it. They allow things to go through them faster because they're so slim. So they can just absorb gases, diffuse gases. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it like that. And reduction of friction. Where do we see this example of reduction of friction? The cavities we just mentioned above pericardial, pleural, and peritoneal, because remember that their job was to lubricate the organs. So remember that they have serous fluid. And I show you images of this, and we go over this one more time next week. So don't worry. If, you should just be able to know pericardial cavity, pleural cavity, pleural cavity and peritoneal. Everything else we've said is new. So don't worry if you feel, if you feel like it's a lot, because it is. You've only learned where they are. You haven't learned what they're made of, and now you do. They're made out of mesothelia. And so since these cavities, their job is to protect from friction, you can maybe understand where that line comes from. Reduction of friction. And I hate the way this is phrased. What we have up here is just fine. You can go ahead and just cross this out. It's just kind of reiterating the same thing. And just know your examples for lab. The locations for lab are okay. And so with the diagram, here is your endothelia, sorry, pardon, your mesothelia is going to be making up this region here. That's going to make up the cavities that hold your organ. It's going to be the one that holds the actual heart itself, the cavity, and now... This is a, may be a little confusing because you're looking at the heart, but what does anybody know what the major artery that comes out of your heart is called? The aorta. And the aorta 
is a blood vessel. So the inside lining, I know you might be able, you not, might not be able to zoom in as much as me here, but you would have your squamous cells on the lining like so, making up your blood vessels. And that's going to be our endothelia. And if we have vascularity, wherever we have the cardiovascular system, which is only in two places, blood vessels and the heart, the inner lining of the heart is actually made out of the same thing. So you encounter endothelia. But if you wanted, since I really want everything to be easy to approach, you only really have to know for our exam that it's found in the blood vessels. That's really the only fact that I'll test you on. I won't ask you about the linear lining of the heart. When we get to cardiovascular, we'll do that. But today, just endothelia. And mesothelia, again, will be all the cavities that contain fluid, serous fluid. Now, when we look at this tissue, you can see that you can see that you're seeing the side of it here, that this is a lateral view of the cell. This is the squamous shape, that flat cell that we're looking at. But you gotta remember that they, we only can see on our pictures for the most part, a 2D image most of the time. And let's actually, do I have it in here? Let's actually see, I'm gonna use your lab notes for a second, if I have them in this good notes. I have never used my tablet in the lab, so I don't have your histology notes here. Hmm. All right, let's keep going. And when we look at these flattened ones, you're only seeing like this one's been sliced, and then this is the rest of it, the surface of it. And so that's what these membranes are made out of, is that they're made out of a sheet of these squamous cells. And underneath these squamous cells, this is the base, and the base where the basement membrane is, and underneath would be the connective tissue all over that end. So you can see that this whole purple lining here is our simple squamous sheet. And so you're gonna encounter two viewpoints. In lab, you encounter the alveolar viewpoint. And yes, that's it, only the alveolar. And I do want to show you. i really rather show. I'd hate uh, making you imagine stuff. So let's just look for it. Take a quick 30-second break. And... and we are almost done. Here we go. And so on our slides in lab, this is the one that we have encountered. And what you're seeing is you're just seeing the lateral view of these cells. You are seeing them from the side. You're not seeing the flattened part of it. You're seeing a lateral portion of it. So what's circled there is an example of the alveoli. And there is a fun image that I always do love. And I, you know, I'm just going to steal it from them. And I'm going to run into copyright issues, but um, as long as you guys don't tell on me, we're fine. Let's see. And so these are little structures that you find in your lungs that are found there at the ends of the trees. And these simple squamous are great for gas diffusion. And can I write on this page? No, I can't. Let's... Mm -mm -mm -mm. 
And so if we look at this image now, this is coming from the lungs. And if we look at these little hollow spaces, this is where gas is traveling through. And when you go inside of these little bubbles, this is what you're looking at when you look at your lab slide. These bubbles are then sliced and you can see the inside. So you're only really capable of seeing the cells like this. That's what you're seeing when you look at your histology slides. Part, dang it, my fat fingers, let's see. Here, that when you look at this, that's exactly what you're visualizing there, only the edges. It's missing all the rest of the cells in that center space of that hollow space, but you're seeing only the boundaries of it. So that's where simple squamous is good at diffusion because they're so thin, and that's, this is exactly where you learn simple squamous, where we say you should be in the lungs. But otherwise, that's our toughest one. And the rest of them are a little more consistent with lab. And let's get rid of this, if I can. Yes, I can. All right. All right, let's move on. And this picture that they have here is like you're seeing it on the surface, okay? On the surface. In lab, we've been trained now to know, find the nucleus, to know the cytoplasm is the space around it, okay? That's all that we've really gone over for that. And then next, I think that's the only one that comes with some newer facts. Whoops, this is not in your slides. Okay. And so next we have our stratified squamous. It's going to come in two formats, right? It has keratinized and non-keratinized. Inside of your oral cavity is the non-keratinized. And on the skin is the keratinized. And so in this case, here's our basement membrane. These cells are always at the bottom, always actively dividing. And they are making cells travel towards the apical side, not towards the basal side. And so... We find these in areas of high friction, so we find them on the surface of skin. We find them in areas inside our inner cavities that have friction, such as the inner lining of the mouth, the throat, the esophagus, the rectum and the anus because we produce feces every day, so we have to make sure we're replacing the surface of the rectum and anus, and in the vagina for sexual reproduction. It's just the areas of friction. And so it replaces the surface continuously. These cells divide very actively, continuously, continuously. And I'm going to skip ahead. This is an error on my end. I accidentally embedded into the wrong segment. But then yours should look like this right after. This is the page after. Stratified squamous epithelia. And then you have two kinds. You have keratinized and you have non-keratinized. Keratinized will always be on the outer skin. Non-keratinized would be the ones in those inner cavities that we said. And so you're really separating stratified squamous into two categories. One is keratinized, one is non. The reason this one's called keratinized is because it produces a protein called keratin. This will be a subject for us next week when we go over skin. And so we'll just leave it there for now. And so it makes it water resistant. It makes it resistant to mechanical stress and losing water. And again, this is found on the surface of your skin. And you'll see how it also makes your hair and nails next week. Non-keratinized is going to be in the inner linings. Again, inner, oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, anus, and vagina. Those are not, do not have keratin. They do not have keratin. That's why they're called non-keratinized. And uh, to give, since we do have time, because I only have five more tissues to do, really do, is this is the beautiful picture of the summary of what you're going to learn next week. And a lot of this you already know. Tuesday lab, you might know a little bit more today. What does uh, this look like to us? This is attached to our hairs and it gives us goose, goosebumps without our control. What, what type of tissue is that? Involuntary. What, what are our three muscles? Skeletal. The, round, well, the one around the heart is. And then the one that we don't control but moves other stuff like digestive tract. Smooth. This is an example of muscle, smooth muscle. 
causing goosebumps. It's attached to hair. And if you look at the skin next, this is what we're going to be learning about is breaking apart this image. What's this line here? The basement membrane. So that means what's above that line this, in this direction? What type of family of tissue? Epithelial tissue. We are learning about stratified squamous. So here you're seeing all of the squamous cells dividing, forming this dead skin layer up top. And not just that. This hair, if you go downwards, you'll see, you'll see it goes, 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 goes. And then there's a duct here. So what the heck is this thing then? It's a gland. These are cuboidal cells. So you can see all up here is stratified squamous. And as we come down here, we are now seeing stratified cuboidal. They just transform into different tissues once they become into the gland and then they secrete oil onto our hair lubricating our hair and that's why you know if you shower a lot you wear out the oil of these secretions and you dry out your hair because you're wearing out the the exocrine secretion of this oil this is an example of an exocrine secretion right on the oil another one too this is a gland that we're not really seeing the bottom of it but this is a sweat pore it secretes, the, the sweat travels out from the gland that's all the way down here, travels out and places sweat here. And it's made out of cuboidal cells because cuboidal cells make up glands. And so what are these uh, red and blue objects there? What are those? Blood vessels. And blood vessels are considered what category in the family of tissues? My Tuesday lab should know this. What family of tissue is blood in? Are they epithelial cells? They're connective tissue. So you can see why they're even called connective. Now this entire layer down here is all connective tissue. And so you can see the vascularity. It drops off materials here. And then the epithelial tissues absorb it. So they don't have blood vessels in this space. And then I said I was going to come back to another term called neuroepithelia. What family of tissue is this that feels sensations that goes to the brain nervous so these are all linked into your skin cells and when someone is when you get a paper cut you feel it because your nerves get pinched they get they send the nerves that you've been that you've been damaged and so you're seeing all your tissues next week you're not going to learn anything new you're just going to really learn how to really find how how all these tissues come together nicely and so, yeah, so really that's just a nice little preview. And so the rest of it is a little quicker. Cuboidal epithelia is going to be make, making up your glands. They're going to make up glands. And this is a nice little picture of the same thing of your skin. Here you can see this is the gland. It produces exocrine secretion, sends it right through the duct, and sends it to the surface to send out sweat. And it's made out of stratified cuboidal. As an FYI, you do not have this one in lab. You have only been taught simple cuboidal, but the good news is, is that it makes, it's great for glands as well. So that's a fun fact about both of these. They make up glands. Simple cuboidal is just a simple line of cuboidal cells. Stratified cuboidal, they just happen to be stratified like this. You can see the two layers. Here's the first layer. Second layer is down here. It's not pretty, but there are more layers. If you compare it to simple, you can see that these go all the way around in just one single arrangement here. That's it. That's a full circle of simple arrangement. And another place that I taught you in lab is that you find them in ducts. And if you wanted to better visual of it in the kidneys, the kidneys is nothing but a pipeway, a sewage pipeline like this. And if you were traveling inside of there, you'd be swimming in urine. And so if you zoom in on that, that little pipe is made out of um, cuboidal cells. And hopefully you're able to draw your eyes now to how that looks so similar to this image down here when we got to cuboidal cells that this is what you're seeing. This is the exact same thing that we saw in lab. You're, if you're inside of that lumen, your urine, if you look around, around that tube, you're seeing simple cuboidal, and hopefully you're seeing how that translates to this. It's just a different section, a different cut, in other words. But otherwise, great at secretion and absorption. There's no complexity here, just like in lab. Great at secretion and absorption, found in glands, and ducks.
found in the kidneys for lab is the best example, or glands. Again, glands. Endocrine glands. If you don't want to write thyroid, I'm going to go easy on you here. Endocrine glands. I know, I know. We're almost done. Five more minutes. And then this will matter next week. You might as well learn it this um, today. Found in sweat ducts underneath the skin. Found in sweat glands. Some glands may be simple. Some glands may be stratified. Right now, you don't care about which one's which. Just an FYI. All right. And so let's move forward. Transitional epithelia found in the urinary bladder. It expands. Everything you know for lab translates well here. The location, what it does is that it expands when the bladder is full. Here's a nice little picture of an empty bladder. And then there's one that's full. And then there are dimensional changes. You can see that when it's full, it tends to be like longer. And then when it's stretched, it slims out in that direction. Otherwise, everything you know for lab is there. Simple columnar. These are going to be found in the digestive tract. They're going to be the ones that can contain microvilli, great for absorption. There's a base membrane underneath. Absolutely nothing different from lab, which is the good news. Do not forget to be able to apply the word apical, that you have microvilli on the apical end. And then pseudostratified columnar found in the trachea, in the windpipe. And so if you look at that inner lining, you'll be seeing this. And pseudostratified is falsely stacked columnar cells. They have cilia, which move mucus, which makes sense. It's always moving mucus back out so you can swallow it in the esophagus. Or it's moving mucus out so you can spit out a loogie out of your mouth. And so pseudostratified, that's its function, is to move mucus in the airway. Nothing different from lab. And then we have those famous little goblet cells, which are embedded within the columnar cells. And now you kind of understand why I kind of made you all just call this cytoplasm. But that little white portion that we were seeing in our lab packet is called mucin. And that just means the ingredient of mucus. And we'll clarify what that means when we get back. This is where we pick up the ingredient of mucus. Oops. Whoops. Ingredient of mucus. I'll fix the spelling too. I don't even know what went wrong there. And thank you for coming to class. If you have any questions, stick around and ask. And then we'll pick up on glands. Only a few more slides and more things that you already know from lab. And Thursday, we go over connected tissues in lab and in lecture. Study, study. Use your lecture notes and your lab at the same time. Everything is the same material this week, so it's a nice thing. No more new new, new, new concepts.